Let's solve an example problem using water activity to determine if something should be shelf-stable, refrigerated, or refrigerated at all times. Uh, so what we're going to start with is the premise that water activity may be approximated, so this is not exact, but approximate, by the mole fraction of water. That's what XW means. Mole fraction, in this case, is number of moles of water divided by total moles. And if we look over here, we will see that here are the A AW, water activity minima, for various microorganisms to grow. So if we want to make sure what we have produced can sit on a shelf and with just about no fear of something growing on it, we want to get below a uh, water activity of 0.75. But most of the time, eh, we're willing to risk just a little bit of mold, sometimes. Um, and so what we're really worried about is these guys. Stuff like staph, salmonella, and listeria. So we want to stay out of, out of that range. Okay, so in our example, in just a moment, we're going to work out the mole fraction of water in a common product. And there are some special rules we got to keep in mind. For an ion or an ionic compound, actually. We have to count number of ions, so total moles of ions. So for example, if you have one mole of sodium chloride, for our purposes here, that counts as two moles of ions, because you have one, when you mix with water, you have one mole of sodium, and you have one mole of chloride. Okay, that's the main special rule we're going to keep in mind. On to our example. Here is an image of honey from my pantry, and here is the nutrition information from that honey. And so the question I want us to deal with is what is approximately the water activity in this honey? So how shall we go about doing that? Well, we're going to take some information from the uh, nutrition facts. We're going to start with this, the fact that there's 16 grams of sugar, and then there's 17 grams of total carbohydrate. What does that mean? So we have 16 grams sugar, and 17 minus 16 is 1, so we have 1 gram of something else that I'm going to call starch. I'm going to assume that's starch, because there's no fiber listed, so starch is the only thing left. And then if we look up here, we see that a serving size is 21 grams. Okay, so we have 17 grams accounted for, so what is going to be that remaining 4 grams? We're going to assume, and you can do this for the homework too, that the remaining 4 grams is water. That's going to be our assumption. All right, so step one is going to be turning each of these numbers of grams into a number of moles. And for that, we need molecular weight. So we'll do this one here. So we have one mole of water is, what's the molecular weight? 18, right? Or just about 18 for our purposes. So we can fill that in. Now starch and sugar are a little more complicated, especially in this case, because in honey, it's not all exactly one precise type of sugar. It's mostly fructose, but it isn't 100.0% fructose. And the starch, we're not exactly sure what that is either. So at the moment, we're going to use a kind of average value for this class of chemicals. I've given you these, these average values in the homework handout, so you can refer to it there. Um, and keep in mind, these are assumptions and averages, and so won't be exactly correct in all situations, but are a pretty good place to start from. So I'm going to go print that out and then fill those numbers in. Okay, having looked up these numbers, I'm ready to do some calculations of how many moles we have. So pulling out my calculator and working down from the water, um, I find that we've got 0.222 moles of water. I've got 7.87 times 10 to the minus 6 moles of starch. That's not very much at all. And for the sugar, I've got about 0 
moles. And what that means is the total number of moles in a serving of honey comes out to be 0 0.284, and I'm rounding here, moles. Okay, so if I want to get the mole fraction, remember that uh, the mole fraction of water is going to be equal to the number of moles of water divided by the total number of moles. And so that, when I push that through my calculator, gets me a value of about 0.78. And we're going to say that is approximately the water activity. And this is unitless, so you notice there's no units there. There's not supposed to be units there. It's a, uh, a fraction. Okay, so we know that the water activity in honey is about 0.78. What does that mean? Well, let's look at the table that we had on the first slide. Uh, that table is from the USDA, by the way. didn't cite that there, but I'm citing it now. And we can see that we are well below the critical value for just about everything um, bacterial. And that's awesome. That's really cool. But we are kind of near the cutoff for most molds. Now, uh, what does that mean? Well, that means we're probably willing to risk it under most circumstances. It also means that I might have a bit of an error in my calculation because many of us know that honey is a thing that you can keep outside of the refrigerator. And uh, in general, people do keep it outside of the refrigerator. And so my value of 0.78 is only approximate. Remember, I assumed a value for sugar that was a, a particular average mix. And in fact, that might not be entirely representative of precisely the molecular com uh, composition of sugar. We also assumed that we had water as the remainder of what all was in there. And it's not actually 100% water, that other four grams. There could be minerals, there could be uh, tiny, tiny little trace amounts of various uh, proteins and elements of the pollen and uh, uh, things like that that are in such small concentration they don't show up on the food, on the nutrition label, but ultimately contribute to um, the, uh, <coughs> the solute composition of the honey, which would drive down the water activity further. So what we find here is that in general, honey should be a food that is safe to keep outside of the refrigerator, but may, may risk mold in some cases. Isn't that neat? So we're going to ask you to do a problem like this uh, with your uh, salad dressing or with some other foods you might find around, um, and, and you'll see that this is one way to preserve food. Now, another thing that is worth noting, this is not the only approach. So you, we could keep food safe by making it hostile, a hostile environment for microbes in another fashion. By example, having the pH be uh, out of a comfortable range, have the pH be very acidic, for example. Or we could put in something that is in fact poisonous to the microbes, but not to us. That's another approach that people sometimes use. And in fact, Often we use a combination of approaches. So you have a food that is acidic, for example, such as our salad dressing. You make it a little bit more acidic. You keep it in a very clean environment when you're manufacturing it. And you make sure you have a high enough level of dissolved salts and sugars that it is a uncomfortable environment for microbes. And all of these things taken together make it so the food can say safe, that is safe from spoilage, safe from microbial growth, for as long a time as possible, which will allow us to get this to market, allow us to have time for people to consume it, allow it, allow uh, people not to get sick uh, for the longest time possible. And that's our goal.